Uh, so I'm going to go with it instead. You know, it doesn't hit me as hard now. Um, just, are we good, Roger? Thanks, brother. Um, I never want to presume upon that. I just forget to ask you. <laughs> um, uh, when I was a kid, Christmas was by far my favorite you know, time of year. I mean, of course I was going to get presents, but it was also my job to decorate the tree. And I eventually expanded that from just the tree to putting lights in every line. So there would be, you know, lights in the in the ceiling uh, corners. There would be lights going vertically in the corners. I mean, sometimes they'd be on the ground. It was just nuts. And I had a good time doing that. And I always, we uh, went to see my uh, Grandma Simmons in, uh, in uh, Virginia and stay with them for a few days and be with my cousins and compare toys and play together and all that fun stuff and have lots of great food. And I always just really look forward to it, but on the trip home from Virginia to go back to Baltimore and kind of resume normal life, I just felt a little, the sense of sadness or loss. And I came to find out later that that's called uh, the post-Christmas letdown or the, the post-seasonal letdown, you know, where you have all this excitement and anticipation and something you're looking forward to, and then it happens, and it may or may not live up to those expectations, but even if it does, at some point it's over and you have to move past it. And so uh, that was something I remember um, experiencing. And I, one, one time on a trip home to Baltimore from being at Grandma's for Christmas, I remember complaining to my dad, hey, how come it's so fun to look forward to Christmas, but after it's over, it feels kind of so depressing or sad. And he told me that my eyes were on the wrong things. See, my eyes were on things that would come to an end. The cakes and the cookies at some point will come to an end, and the presents and gift giving will come to an end, and the playing with your new toys will come to an end, and all the Christmas songs. I mean, I think if you turn on radio now from like either November or October through the end of December, you're hearing Christmas music. That'll come to an end. And, uh, you know, the church services and the candlelight uh, hymn sings and all those things that we look forward to will come to an end. So what he told me was, we need to... Uh, put our eyes on something that we have to look forward to. And so while the Christmas, uh, Advent and Christmas season, is certainly a celebration of what has happened, that Jesus Christ was manifest in the flesh, that the Word of God did become flesh and dwell, dwell among us, that we need to, uh, in order to avoid a post-holiday letdown or the uh, post-seasonal depression or whatever you want to call it, have something in view that's beyond so that we can continue to look forward to it. And we have the second coming of Christ. And I think uh, far too often we get caught up in Jesus as a little baby in a manger. And I remember uh, my pastor at the Central Presbyterian Church in Baltimore saying that he thought that the world was ready to receive and celebrate Jesus as a little baby because he didn't, hadn't opened his mouth yet. Uh, and he hadn't uh, braided a, a, a whip of cords and driven out the money changers in the temple yet. And he hadn't uh, offended everyone and anyone with the teaching of, of God's word and the doctrines uh, that, that ran counter to their culture and to their religious traditions yet. So everyone's willing to receive a cute little baby, but when he grows up and actually does something for God, they're not so keen on receiving him. Uh, you and I who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, we have dealt with those things uh, to an extent. Now, every time we open the scriptures of the Gospels, Jesus is saying something else that hadn't occurred to us before that offends us and gives us something in our lives yet again, in our hearts yet again, that needs to be changed. But we have come to understand that those are more opportunities than they are points of, uh, of uh, condemnation. You see, the Holy Spirit convicts with hope. He says, this is what's wrong in your thinking. This is what's wrong in your heart. This is what's wrong in your speech. This is what's wrong in your actions. But if you'll allow me to work through you, I will change that and, and, and take your weakness and make it into a strength. So we've come to understand that, but the world hasn't. And they're not ready to receive Christ as offensive, as... Uh, as uh, aggressive, as telling the truth, as um, not living up to men's expectations, but only doing what God told him to do, 
They're not willing to risk or ready to receive him that way. But you and I are. And so to avoid the post-Christmas letdown, we can remember not only who Jesus was when he was laid in a manger wrapped in swallowing clothes, we can remember who he became. And we can look forward to maybe learning some things about that from him. You know, everyone asks, what happened to Jesus when he was a teenager? There was actually some, uh, some indications of what Jesus was like as a teenager. And we find those from Luke chapter 2. And let's see. It says in Luke chapter 2 and verse 40, the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. That's a child. That's from eight days old after he's been presented to the temple and circumcised according to uh, the law that he actually gave Moses on Mount Sinai. Uh, then uh, it says that as, as a child he grew, he waxed strong in spirit, he was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And then it says in verse 41, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. So every year they went up to Jerusalem for Passover. It just so happened that when Jesus was 12, that they went again. And I think we know the story how uh, they celebrated the feast, then his parents went home, and they discovered that Jesus was not among them. They had gone a day's journey. And, uh, you know, I know us men are, are hesitant to uh, ask for directions or to turn around, even when it's revealed to us that we've gone the wrong way. Uh, but his parents had to turn around and walk uh, two extra days' journey in order to get Jesus. They had to walk one day back to Jerusalem, and once they get him, and maybe tan his backside, then they have to walk the extra day in the other direction. Uh, so, uh, and they find him teaching in the temple... And the, and the Pharisees and the scribes and the teachers of the law were marveling at the wisdom that was pouring out of him, at the knowledge of God's scriptures and holy word. Now, it, it's funny to see, okay, here's the God who wrote the law, now in the temple teaching the law. But remember, he was also a 12-year-old boy. And so, of course, like even knowing he was the son of God, I marvel that as a 12-year-old boy, Jesus was in the temple teaching people who had been studying the book, and teaching the book for 30, 40, 50 years, and they were marveling at his wisdom and knowledge and his understanding. In the Jewish tradition, and they even do this today, when a, a boy or girl turns 12, they are considered to be, in some sense, an adult. You know, a boy who turns 12 is now a, a young man, and they celebrate the bar and the bat mitzvah when the Jewish boy or girl turns 12 even today. It's a big celebration. And at that time, in Jesus' day, it was uh, considered that a 12-year-old boy was to then learn the custom and trade of his father so that he could grow up in it. And when his father passed on, he would carry, up, carry on doing that custom or trade. We know that uh, Jesus was a carpenter because he was the son of a carpenter, Joseph. But when his mother and father found him in the temple teaching... He said to his mother, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? He wasn't doing any carpentry in the temple. It was somehow revealed to him at the age 12, maybe because they were at the, uh, Jerusalem for the Passover, and maybe by the Holy Spirit, God tapped young Jesus, 12 years old, just become a man, on the shoulder and said, one day you are going to be that Passover lamb that you see sacrificed. One day you are going to be the teacher of Israel. One day you are going to be the high priest over Israel. And so Jesus was getting a head start at the age of 12, learning and going about and practicing doing his father's business. And it says at the conclusion of that story, in Luke chapter 2 and... Verse 52, this is the only verse we have about Jesus' teenage and young adult years. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So I appreciate that Christmas is about a cute little baby. And I appreciate that Christmas is about the innocence of 
the Son of God being presented to mankind as a helpless little baby. And let's not overlook that. Let's not forget that, in a sense, the Word of God who became flesh and dwelt among us entrusted himself to humanity. And we know how vile and violent and greedy and selfish and self-centered humanity is. And yet God said, I love you so much. I will become one of you and present myself to you and as a baby, helpless and totally at your mercy. Let's not forget that God, God loved us so much and the plan of salvation was so precious and important to him that he presented himself helpless and innocent as a little baby and literally anything could have happened to him. You know what a chance God was taking doing that? You know what a chance the Word of God was taking becoming one of us? And it only got better from there. So we don't say st stuck at Christmas. It only got better. It says that he increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. There's nothing wrong with people liking you. That's what favor with man means. You know, oftentimes we'll get suspicious. You know, there's a, there's a, a, a teacher on television, a, a, I should say a preacher on television, or there's a preacher that's popular on YouTube, and you get suspicious. What's wrong with this person that so many others like him or her? There's nothing wrong with the world liking someone, even someone that's, that, 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 that's a, a minister of the gospel. But it says first he grew in favor with God, and then in growing favor in favor with God, God granted him favor with man. So don't make man's favor your priority. Make sure you're doing God's work according to God's will, and then He will help you to increase in favor with man if it's if it's uh, His design for your life. Uh, there are people who were very popular in their day who were in the very center of God's will. I think of uh, George Whitfield, who was the world's first superstar preacher. And they used to send bulletins, uh, you know, back before you had uh, uh, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, they would send written uh, poster bills to cities where he was going to be preaching for weeks ahead of time. And they would mail them, or people who were in the, the, his organization would hand deliver them and post them on street corners and on buildings and in any public place where people would see it, George Whitfield is coming to preach. And uh, for weeks and months ahead of his arrival, and by the time he got there, it was at a fever pitch, the expectation of George Whitfield getting to preach, or me getting to hear George Whitfield preach, and he would draw thousands and tens of thousands of people to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the key is that he was seeking to do God's will and gain favor with God, and God then granted him favor with man. So let's not get that out of, out of whack. But it's not a hallmark or a, a badge of honor for a Christian to be despised by the society in which they live. In fact, Christians ought to be the best citizens of any society in which they live. The government ought to know that Christians are not going to break the law. The government ought to know that Christians are going to pay their taxes. The government ought to know that when there are uh, 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 which natural disasters, that the Christians are going to be the first ones to help their neighbors. We ought to grow in favor with man because we're first seeking to grow in favor with God. It says he grew in stature. That means he got taller, and that's just part of the, the natural process of growing up. But it also means his shoulders got broader. And I would say there's nothing wrong. In fact, there's something very right about young people doing hard physical labor and engaging in sports and other activities that will help them to grow in stature. Uh, we shouldn't have uh, sedentary teenagers in front of the computer all day, uh, texting and tweeting and playing video games. They ought to be out doing things that will make their shoulders broader and their arms thicker and their legs stronger. Uh, we ought to encourage our children in sports uh, not, to, uh, not, not to step on 
others in order to get ahead, but to improve themselves in a way that they show forth on the athletic field or on the basketball court. It's okay and it's uh, highly encouraged, and Jesus showed us that we ought to grow in stature. And first of all, he grew in wisdom. He grew in wisdom. That means he learned. That means he studied. That means he remembered. That means he reread things that he had already read before uh, so that he would continue uh, to refresh his mind and refresh his memory and learn new concepts that he had not yet been introduced to. Uh, our young people and even us older folks need to study. We need to be in books. We need to be in God's Word. Uh, we need to be listening to Christian teachers and preachers. We need to be reading on other subjects, you know, like music, like home improvement, uh, like, like culture, uh, like arts. We need to be growing in mind and in wisdom. And, and Jesus did all these things. And then finally, I want to show you what happened to Jesus as a result of that process. It says he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. He presented himself to humanity as a baby in a manger, helpless and innocent. He then presented himself to Pontius Pilate and said nothing against the accusations that were brought against him. He presented himself again, helpless and innocent. He was handed over to sinners who crucified him. He was buried in a borrowed tomb, and three days later he rose again. And then before he ascended into heaven, he commanded his disciples two things. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he's in heaven now, but here's what he's going to look like when he comes back. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9. I, John, who am also your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. That's the first day of the week, the day we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ every Sunday. And heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega. The first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book. Send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks was one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, garment down to the foot, girt about the breast with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. And his feet burned like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a two sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. His face is bright as the sun. His hair is wool white. His eyes are as a flame of fire, seeing through, uh, seeing through my lies, seeing through my excuses, seeing through my fears, seeing through my doubts, and looking deep into the depths of my soul and in the depths of your soul. There is something to look forward to. Don't forget that Jesus was a cute little baby in a manger, but don't forget that he's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Don't forget that he will see through the lies and excuses of humanity. Don't forget that a sharp two-edged sword proceeds out of his mouth, and anyone that's running counter to the will and work of God is going to be cut down when Jesus returns. So you and I need not stay in the post-holiday letdown because we have something even greater than the manger in Bethlehem to look forward to. It says his voice was as the sound of many waters. And I've often wondered, what is the attraction of waterfalls uh, to people? We will hike uh, dozens and sometimes uh, close to 100 miles just to see a remote waterfall. And it's simply a ledge off which water plunges into a lower pool. Uh, when you think about the dynamics and the, and, and the rational uh, explanations behind it, it doesn't make any sense. 
until I read that Jesus' voice was as the sound of many waters. And I wonder if when we come to that uh, beautiful waterfall and the mist coming off and the thunderous cascade of the, of the water hitting the rocks and the pools beneath, if we are not getting uh, just a foretaste of the sound of Jesus' voice when he returns, we have something even greater to look forward to. So I say instead of a post-holiday letdown, we have a post-Christmas ramp-up to the return of Jesus Christ. I'll invite the musicians and singers who are going to close us in worship.